Good morning. I uh, want to talk to you today about the implications of the characteristics of individuals with FASD on the criminal justice system and make some recommendations with respect to dealing them with them. Uh, what I noticed today is that scientists uh, are very good at PowerPoint presentations. And they're also very good at science. And I think what the justice system uh, needs, needs to catch up with realizing the uh, uncontrovertible facts with respect to FASD and the characteristics of individuals with FASD in the criminal justice system. I want to go briefly through the brain domains to see uh, what characteristics within the brain domains have an effect on the criminal justice system. And I'm sure that you've, you've been to conferences and you've had discussions with respect to brain domains, and so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But these are the 10 brain domains. Achievement, dealing with academic skills. Cognition, dealing with general thinking ability. Executive functioning, we heard about this morning with goal-directed behavior, self-regulation, initiation, planning. Uh, organizing, self-monitoring, adaptation, we also talked about this morning, meeting the challenges of daily living. Attention, uh, selective, focused, sustained, and flexible attention, and concentration, hyperactivity, impulsivity, language skills, which are big in the criminal justice system, expressive and receptive language, memory, uh, capacity to consolidate, store, and retrieve information, gross motor skills, uh, sensory, the ability to process and social communication, the ability to relay information coherently and cohesively. So we have 10 brain domains here, and I did my own uh, scientific experiment and looked at those domains and the characteristics of individuals with FASD and how they're affected. And I came up with 90% of all of these brain domains having some relevance to individuals within the criminal justice system. They would probably call this soft science, but I believe very strongly in it. There's no other disability where the characteristics create the same kind of risk for individuals to come before the criminal justice system. If we look at some of the characteristics of individuals with FASD, we'll see the implications for the criminal justice system. And, and to give you some examples of clients that I've dealt with that specifically relate to these characteristics. Impulsivity, uh, the mere act of, I've had a client who saw a jar of change at a hotel sitting on the desk, grabbing that jar of change and walking off. Um, a purse on a hook in a beauty salon and walking past and simply grabbing that purse and moving on. The inability to uh, understand or foresee consequences combined with things like suggestibility and mimicry, which we know is a, a large characteristic, in my view creates a toxic combination uh, for coming into contact with the criminal justice system. Things like sensitivity to surroundings. I can think of a situation, um, I worked in the Yukon, in the jurisdiction of the Yukon, of an individual who was sitting in the uh, court and something happened, and immediately he was suddenly standing in the prisoner's docket, surrounded by RCMP and sheriffs who either had their guns uh, ready to go or, or their hands on their waist. And the elevation from zero to 100 happened within seconds. And so the sensitivity to surroundings and the reaction, you can see how that becomes a, a huge potential um, in the community, in a bar situation where there's a fight or where there's alcohol involved. That escalation can take a situation um, to very serious level where suddenly there are a number of charges uh, where there wouldn't have been before. There are other characteristics when we look that we see why I termed this talk the revolving door of criminal justice because once some individuals with FASD get into the criminal justice system, I see them as continually moving through that system on a revolving door basis. And what I've often said is that I've had clients who are serving virtual uh, life sentences in 30 to 45 day increments because they're not out for any longer than it takes uh, something to happen and they're immediately back in and before the court uh, and with dealing with it, they're in for short periods of time but out for less. 
So we look at learning disabilities and, and difficulties with time impairment, uh, intellectual impairment, language impairment. When you think about what you need to get through the criminal justice system, what we demand of individuals who are in the criminal justice system is exactly what individuals with FASD cannot deliver for us. So the ability to get to court or to the probation office. When you look at um, language and, and intellectual impairment, the sheer ability to move through the system. So think about what we need once we're charged with a criminal offense, which maybe nobody in this room has thought through that process because they haven't been charged. But you need the ability to contact a lawyer in the first place. You need to be able to get to that lawyer's office to talk to them. You need to be able to explain what the charge is and the situation that brought about that charge. You need to be able to understand what the lawyer is telling you in terms of legal advice and you need to be able to provide instructions. And when you look at some of these characteristics, then you see how difficult it is for someone to be able to do that. Once you have conditions placed on you, whether it's before you've been uh, convicted or after you've been convicted, think about what we demand of individuals to do at that point in time when we're looking at um, procedural breaches often, when we're looking at community dispositions, we have someone who can't necessarily understand time, has intellectual impairments, has impulsivity, and, and what do we demand of them? Well, you need to report to the police station or RCMP office every other Thursday at 3 p.m. You need to be at your probation office every Tuesday. You need to get to your group uh, you know, each Friday at 4 p.m. and you need to be there on time or else you're gonna face further breaches before the system. So again, we're asking of individuals who can't deliver exactly that which they can't deliver and not necessarily providing them with the support that they require. This is what the criminal justice system, uh, the expectation of the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is based on the norm normative assumption that a person acts in a voluntary manner makes informed choices with respect to the decision to commit crimes and learns from their own behavior as well as the behavior of others. That is the fundamental premise of the system. This is what we see and what we understand. And this is what I always envision individuals with FASDC um, when they think about the criminal justice system. All the same words are there but they're jumbled and it's very difficult to comprehend exactly uh, what it is that they need to know. I was going to make a reference with respect to what Professor Roach has said in the past. I didn't realize he was going to be on the jury and so I'm not trying to shine the jury when speaking of this. But Professor Roach has said if the criminal justice system is premised on assumptions about individuals understanding the consequences of their actions and learning from their mistakes, then the presence of a permanent brain damage that affects memory, impulsivity, and suggestibility challenges that very presumption. So all of the characteristics of an individual with FASD really brings uh, into play the question, in my mind, is what is the definition of an operating mind? It challenges the whole fundamental basis of what we're doing within the criminal justice system. And so when I look at uh, recommendations for what we need to do within the cr criminal justice system, really the first one is to keep them out of the system in the first place. The criminal justice system is no place for individuals with FASD and we're ill-equipped to deal with it. And one of the reasons that we're ill-equipped to deal with it is that the whole premise of the criminal justice system is based on uh, temporary measures. We're de we are designed to get people out of the system ultimately so that they can go on uh, to live within the community uh, and be an active community member. So what do we need to keep them out of the system? There's been a lot of uh, discussion about these kinds of things this morning, and I do want to say that I, I do think that uh, Alberta is certainly a leader in the kinds of strategies that they have created, um, but this is, a, this is a national problem, this is an international problem, and we need to create some consistency, uh, certainly across the country, in what we do. So diagnosis is really 
uh, one of the most important um, important factors. We need to know what we're dealing with with an individual. We've seen that not all individuals clearly who come before the criminal justice system have an FASD, but we need to know the population that we're dealing with. We need to have an interdisciplinary multi-sectoral approach to coordinated uh, service delivery, and I think that the Minister of Justice in Alberta did talk about that this morning. What I find more often is that a lot of service delivery uh, works in their own silos and there isn't a transfer of um, information and also services to coordinate service delivery. And we need clearly to have proper resources, and so we either need new resources or to shuffle existing resources that deal more with support and prevention. Once we get into the criminal justice system, I always feel that uh, we've lost a little bit or that we've failed. The issue with respect to diagnosis and this transfer of, of information um, certainly brings about the question of how do you transfer that information? Can you use that? Because uh, information that's contained within a diagnosis is clearly subject to uh, ATIP information, PEPIDA information, and it's very sensitive information that individuals don't necessarily want widespread. And so those are issues that we really need to look at and we really need to think about. I would say to that that having, you know, having legislation that prevents certain information doesn't prevent coordinated delivery. It just requires understanding um, how you share that information, when you share that information. Issues of consent come up, and certainly um, there will be issues then with respect to informed consent and whether individuals can uh, give you informed consent about using their diagnoses for certain purposes. But in that case, usually legislation speaks to that too in, in dealing with necessity and what's in the best interest of an individual. So we need to look at privacy um, because it's certainly an issue, but I would say that it doesn't prevent information from being transferred and assistance by, from being used. Now I recognize that not all individuals are going to be successfully kept out of the criminal justice system. It's my hope when we talked about diagnoses, uh, there is a lot more focus on youth, uh, adolescent diagnoses than adult diagnoses. And so we're going to be dealing with a certain part of the population that are clearly gonna come into contact with the criminal justice system. There are going to be charges that it's necessary in the public interest and public safety that are going to appear before the criminal justice system, and, and I absolutely respect that. So once they're in, what do we do with them? Again, this morning there was discussion about education of all justice professionals, and I believe very strongly that it's, it's necessary. That includes the judiciary, the Crown, uh, defense. I have, in my experience, heard from defense lawyers uh, who have practiced for 40 years who have said they've never dealt with an individual with FASD. I've heard from judges who run mental health courts in places like Toronto where they process 30,000 people a year say he's not sure he's ever seen anyone with FASD. And I can guarantee you that if you work in the criminal justice system, you have seen or dealt with someone who has an FASD whether you recognize it or not. So there was some discussion this morning about diversion and alternative measures, and that is uh, an extremely important factor. What's happening now is uh, not consistent across the country. It depends on the jurisdiction. It often depends on the players and on volunteers, and we need to find some consistent approach to diversion because in many situations, it is appropriate uh, and in the public interest to use those kinds of tactics. This is a government uh, that if there's one thing that I can say about them, the federal government, is that they're very, very good at legislative reform. They have brought in uh, huge amounts of legislative reform, and so I think there's places where we can use that legislative reform in positive ways to help individuals, or they can look at legislative reform. Jonathan Rudin will be speaking more about this uh, tomorrow, but 
at this point in time, there are numerous mandatory minimums in the criminal code that have no escape clauses, and so judges have no ability to tailor sentences to actually meet or accommodate the individuals before them, and it's my belief that escape clauses are extremely important uh, and appropriate where there are mandatory minimums in sentencing. Alaska has included FASD as a mitigating factor in sentencing. There are other uh, states in the United States who are looking at including that, and that is a potential. At this point in time, if you look at uh, a cross-section of case law across the country, FASD has been used in a non-consistent manner. It is sometimes considered to be an aggravating factor. It is sometimes considered to be a mitigating factor, and it's occasionally used in a very neutral way, even if it's mentioned. And I believe that we need to have more consistency with respect to that as well. The Youth Criminal Justice Act has a number of tools that I truly believe can really assist individuals uh, with an FASD. Section 34 allows for FASD assessments. The court often feels when dealing with adult offenders that their hands are tied in terms of how to get that diagnosis and what they can do, unless we're dealing with provisions like uh, fitness or mental disorder. Uh, there isn't really a way to get the assessments that we need, so something akin to Section 34 in the YCJA uh, would be of assistance. In the uh, Youth Act, counsel is insured uh, for youth coming before the court so they don't have to navigate the system alone. The system for any, uh, anybody in this room would be complicated and complex to go through, but imagine trying to do it on your own with an FASD, and so provisions akin to that as well. Case conferencing is, uh, in my view, one of the most important uh, provisions in the YCJA. We've talked about it this morning. It allows for this multidisciplinary approach. It allows for all players to come to the table and really talk about what is best for an individual and how to work together. And that is vital, uh, and that is often missing. The left hand is often not talking to the right hand and someone is shot out of a jail onto the street and left to navigate for themselves uh, until they end up the next week, the next month, the next year back in the same circumstances. There was some discussion just prior to this with respect to the Corrections Act but I truly believe that uh, including the duty to accommodate individuals with FASD in the Corrections Act really becomes an issue of fundamental human rights and how we deal with people. The um, standardized checklists and risk, risk assessment tools used in corrections uh, don't necessarily uh, relate or are valid or reliable for individuals with FASD. So we really need to look at all the tools that we use to ensure that they accommodate the characteristics of individuals with FASD. And as I indicated, this really is a human rights issue, and it's my belief that FASD should be a protected right in human rights legislation across the country. I'd like to take credit for uh, all of the recommendations, but I can't. The Canadian Bar Association, I'm sure you're aware, have been working quite hard. There's been two resolutions passed, and I'm not going to go through the resolutions, but I've put them up here for your reference if you want, and they've included a number of the suggestions that I've talked about today um, with the belief that individuals with FASD need to be treated uh, differently and fairly before the system. I think the scales of justice are tipped and precarious when we're dealing with individuals at this point in time who have an FASD. And I think what we really need to do, and, and it's difficult when you're talking about an establishment uh, with revered time-honored practices that go back hundreds of years, but truly what we need to do is turn justice upside down right now we need a paradigm shift when we're dealing with individuals with FASD. And we need to make changes that are quite dramatic in order to achieve the balance of justice. Thank you.